spot is it? Welcome to episode number 354 of the Beyond Social Media Show, the podcast for all of you marketing, advertising, public relations, and communications professionals. You can find us by searching for Beyond Social Media Show. We are recording on June 26, 2021. If you missed it, you'll want to go back and listen to our last episode, my interview with Alberto Jose Manzarate Suarez. He's a multicultural marketing expert, and that's what we talk about, multicultural marketing, among other things. In next episode, BL has a fascinating interview with Bob Hoffman, who is an author and social media critic, and we'll leave it at that. You'll want to watch and listen to that episode. But we get uh, to tackle a lot of topics this week, among them, Twitter to the silver screen, from Twitter to the silver screen, Spotify and Facebook go live audio, Google's duty to warn, list building, digital resurrecting, digitally resu resurrecting journalists. I'm having a hard time pronouncing our show <laughs> topics this week. <laughs> Scaring, scaring phone scam, spammers, uh, ticketed Twitter, Lego typewriter, Hyundai acquires Boston Dynamics, Apple destroys opens, and stick around for some stats on family and friend word of mouth relating to brands. We kick it off the best start of the week in BL. You have that honor. What was that, BL? Well, I think this one is fascinating, actually, because this is about the movie Zola, uh, which started as a viral Twitter thread in 2015. And it's now a movie and a book. And it's a story about how a, a trip to Florida spiraled into sex trafficking and crime and horror. And um, the marketing of it is also fascinating. So this is from a New York Times story, and uh, that's by Jenna Wortham. And so back in October 2015, Azia, who goes by Zola, Azia King, recounted on Twitter the long but full of suspense story in a thread of about 148 tweets. And this is also uh, said to be the first thread on Twitter. Um, and the thread recounted the saga of her really shocking trip to Florida with a woman she met the day before at Hooters. And, and how it quickly spiraled into a mess of sex trafficking, crime and deception. And the hashtag, the story as fans called it, uh, went viral instantly. And so the movie is gonna be um, released on June 30th and there's a hardcover book of the story, which King read live on Clubhouse. So she um, established this new modality of online storytelling and she's credited with helping to inspire Twitter to create a way to uh, link multiple tweets together in a thread, which is um, it's incredible that that wasn't always there. But um, other key characters from the story uh, took to Facebook, Reddit and Twitter with their own versions. It was kind of a, a modern day Rashomon and, and it went on for weeks. And uh, there, there were calls all along, you know, it, as you were reading it, you could see that it was a film or a TV show. And so people kept sharing their fantasy ensemble cast. So it's coming out and uh, it's been made into um, something that's sort of sarcastic and um, it, it sounds fascinating. Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. I um, I hadn't thought of it, but it's obvious. Your mention of uh, reading the book on uh, on Clubhouse, poetry, book readings uh, on live audio that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, speaking of which, we've got some more live audio uh, moves in the industry, uh, including Spotify. Uh, this is from a Verge article by Ashley Carmen. Uh, so Spotify has jumped into the live audio um, market, formally launching Green Room their app for live audio. It's on, available on iOS and Android. Um, it is their Clubhouse co clone, of course, and allows uh, users to host live conversations about sports, music, and culture, appropriate for Spotify. They basically reskinned the locker room, which we've discussed in previous episode, their, uh, their acquisition from March that focused solely on sports content. So those existing users of locker room will have to get used to having music and culture, but uh, I'm sure they'll be fine. Uh, green Room features native recording, uh, so users can save their shows and they can distribute them as podcasts. Uh, on episode uh, 258, we discussed um, Spotify's acquisition of 
Anchor, which is a podcast creation editing platform. And obviously Spotify has been making tons of moves in, in the podcasting space as well. So uh, this uh, feeds into that as well, allowing people to host their live audio and then turn it into a podcast. Um, they have also, Spotify has also uh, announced a creator fund. Uh, so they will pay uh, creators based on how popular the rooms are and their engagement in them. Uh, they're working on exclusive deals with creators uh, that will be uh, revealed over the summer, apparently. Uh, and creators can sign up for more information. We'll put a link in the show notes for that. And then concurrently, Facebook has jumped into the live audio um, uh, market with live audio rooms. This is from TechCrunch's Sarah Perez. Uh, so they have officially rolled out live audio rooms in the U.S. on iOS. Uh, They're starting with public figures in select Facebook groups uh, and are debuting an initial set of U.S. podcast partners as well. So they're entering the podcast market. Um, their uh, live audio rooms are available to any verified public figure or creator in the U.S. who is in good standing with Facebook and is using either a profile or Facebook's new pages experience on iOS. Um, they are launching with dozens of Facebook groups. Both live audio and podcasts will become more broadly available uh, in the not too distant future, I guess. Um, a hundred percent of Facebook users in the U.S. are able to listen to live audio rooms and podcasts as of uh, now, and listeners can show support to the public figures of the live audio rooms by sending stars. Stars you can buy during the conversation and then you can use them at any time, but you send a star so that the, um, the, um, the host knows that you're a fan basically. And uh, the host can, can bump the listener up to a front row if you send a star. So, uh, and that's a section that highlights the people who have sent stars. Um, so obviously that's a way for hosts of live audio to allow, you know, it's a way for you to get recognized by your way in uh, and hope that the host lets you up on the stage and lets you talk. So that's one tactic people will be using to brand themselves, I guess. Um, and, you know, those are obviously the stars let the hosts easily recognize who their supporters are. Uh, an interesting feature here is, uh, is uh, hosts can select a nonprofit or a fundraiser to support during a conversation. And then listeners and speakers can directly donate. There's a progress bar that goes along with it to show, show how much has been uh, uh, raised during the show. So nonprofits are gonna be all over that for fundraising uh, galas maybe, dig digital galas. Uh, both members and visitors can listen to rooms in public groups, but in private groups, uh, they are limited to just group members. So some interesting developments uh, from Facebook on the live audio front. Well, you know, from what I've been reading, the um, participation in Clubhouse is down. Uh, and, and the platform that's leading right now is Spaces on Twitter. And Twitter just opened up applications for two monetization tools. One is Super Follows and the other is Ticketed Spaces. And um, this is an article from Tube Filter by Jeff Weiss. And Twitter started accepting applications for ticketed spaces and for paid super follows. And uh, this is the interesting part. Twitter will only take a 3% cut after uh, Google or Apple's 30% cut uh, from the creator's first $50,000 in earnings. I don't know how they came up with that number, but that up until $50,000, you only have to pay them 3% of what you earn. Um, to be eligible for ticketed spaces, you need at least a thousand followers. You have to have hosted at least three spaces in the past 30 days. Um, and for super follows, you need 10,000 followers. So super follows enable creators to sell Patreon like subscriptions with special perks and ticketed spaces refer to the platform's clubhouse clone spaces uh, where creators can sell tickets to live audio events and users who apply for early access become part of a small test group. Um, that uh, before both features are rolled out more broadly and is apparently only rolling out in the US for starters, but um, applications for super follows, which allow creators to sell their monthly subscriptions for three, five or $10 are only available to iOS users right now, but ticketed spaces, which can be priced anywhere from $1 to $999 are available on both iOS and Android. So right now, 
uh, both of those are only available in the US and you, you have to, if you want to apply, you go to the sidebar and you tap monetization to learn uh, more and see whether you're eligible. And uh, Twitter's executive, um, Esther Crawford wrote on, uh, wrote about the rev share plan in, in a thread on Twitter. And uh, she said, we want to ensure that emerging voices are able to earn money, which is why they'll be eligible to earn a large share starting out. Uh, why $50,000? Earning $50,000 from super followers and ticketed show uh, spaces shows that you're getting value from these features and that we're helping you make real money. Um, why they're going to take more after 50,000, who knows? But um, a host of Twitter spaces can now download a recording of their space. And there are a number of other new features, including uh, the ability to listen on the web rather than just on mobile, and also scheduled spaces. So uh, spaces is apparently growing at a rather quick pace. I think we should do the show on spaces one week. Yeah, we should try that. I. Um... I'm not surprised. I mean, there's two two things that are pushing this um, innovation because we're seeing innovation from Twitter. We're seeing innovation from uh, from Spotify and Facebook with live audio. But it's it's both Substack, the popularity of Substack, and the subscription paid subscription model that Substack has innovated, and then obviously Clubhouse, the popularity of live live audio. It does not surprise me at all that uh, Clubhouse is declining in use um, because you have to build an audience there. Right, and, and you already have one yeah. in other platforms, yeah. you know? And and the thing about the, you know, you can charge up to $999. That means that uh, political fundraising, I guess, could happen on the platform, which is very interesting. That and conferences and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, high profile webinars. I mean, definitely uh, yeah. a lot really of really interesting. Yeah. yeah, so this was an interesting list building tactic that I came across. We have discussed, um, Product Hunt before. Uh, we find a lot of stuff on Product Hunt, um, but uh, this was an, a great example of list building using uh, using Product Hunt in part. Uh, there was a, I don't even know who this is by, who created this. WeCreators.co is the, is, the, is the company that's providing this. Anyway, uh, they uh, shared on a popular platform, Product Hunt, where your audience is like to, likely to be, their audience is likely to be on Product Hunt. Uh, they, they basically, they created a creator's toolkit. And so they shared that toolkit of Product Hunt. Creators are gonna be, the, gonna be able to find it there. They offered immense value uh, 250 plus tools for creators. So that's a that's a great deal of value. Uh, they gave a preview of what you're to get if you sign up. So they have an embedded spreadsheet of all the different tools. So you can see what you will be getting before you even, uh, even give up your email. And then this is the part that I found fascinating. They hint at more value if you provide a valid email. So if you don't, you know, if you just don't use, use some junk email to download it, um, but you don't want to get any further communications, um, they're asking you for a valid email and they say, no, your, your right email, use your right email to have a big surprise in a couple of days. So <laughs> more value after you get that immense value of the creator toolkit. I thought it was a really clever, clever way to go about it. You know, um, several episodes ago, or who knows, I have no t concept of time, but I interviewed Miranda Head, and Miranda was a, is a TikTok influencer, and she was hired by Flow Flowcast, which is an accounting software firm, to be their social media person, and she just left Flowcast to join uh, to become a creator manager on LinkedIn because LinkedIn is beefing up their platform and tools for uh, creators and uh, that'll be coming up soon. So everybody is apparently realizing the value of creators to their platforms. And, you know, cause after all, we're the ones who provide the content for the most part. So it's, it's interesting that every platform copies every other. I mean, I find that, you know, just sort of bizarre. But um, Google announced this week that they're testing a feature that notifies users when they're searching for something that's a rapidly evolving topic and that results are maybe not reliable yet. 
Uh, so uh, this is from Vox Recode by Sharon Gafferty and uh, also uh, from a Google post by Danny Sullivan. And uh, so they're going to notify people that the topic may have unreliable results. It's a, it's a notable step because um, they want to give people more context about breaking information that's popular online, like suspected UFO sightings or developing news stories. The most recent example being what happened in Florida. Uh, immediately, there were conspiracy theories um, about uh, John McAfee uh, having files in that building and, uh, you know, crazy stuff. And um, so the prompt warns users that the results they're seeing are changing quickly and reads in part, if this topic is new, it can sometimes take time for results to be added by reliable sources. And they confirmed to Recode that they started testing it about a week ago. Um, and I have a, an example of the prompt uh, from um, from Google. Uh, currently, the notice is only showing up in a small percentage of searches that tend to be about developing trending topics. But on Google's blog, Danny Sullivan, who's now the public liaison for search, explains that to help with this, we've trained our systems to detect when a topic is rapidly evolving and a range of sources haven't yet weighed in. We'll now uh, show a notice indicating that may, it may be best to check back later when more information from a wider range of sources might be available. So it builds on Google's efforts to help users with search literacy uh, and to better understand the context about what they're looking up. And in April 2020, they released a feature telling people when there aren't enough good matches for their search. And then in February 2021, Google added an about button next to most search results, showing people a brief Wikipedia description of the site they're seeing when that's available. Then there's still some really questions about how all of this is going to work. For example, you know, what sources does Google find to be reliable on a given search result and how many reliable sources do they need to weigh in before a questionable trending topic loses that label? As the feature rolls out, we can expect to see more discussion about how it's implemented, but it's an interesting turn of events because obviously it's AI powered. Um... I mean, it, it goes to it, 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 how, how to determine what's, what's legit and what's not. Um, you know, there are independently verifiable facts. So if a site um, consistently cites independently verifiable facts in their content, links to legitimate uh, sources of, of verification of what they're saying about, uh, that's probably going to get a higher authority score from Google than other sites that don't. And so I imagine that would play into the algorithm for this new feature that they, they're rolling up. But it's good. It's good to, um, especially for breaking news, you get a lot of junk out there. And clearly they're looking for legitimate news organizations to weigh in. And that yeah. doesn't always happen as soon as yeah. people on the ground are reporting on social media. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a step in the right direction. We'll see how it plays out. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's a tactic you can use when you get those uh, spam phone calls, um, calling in and uh, don't know who it is. Uh, I just ignore those, but some people answer them. But this is a very clever uh, way of scaring sp phone, spam phone yeah. spammers. This is from Now This News. Some guy um, came up with this and they recorded it. He's got a very deep voice. So he gets a spam call and he answers it and he says, thank you for calling the CIA. You've reached our scam and fraud division. Please hold while we download your incoming and outgoing call logs. And it goes on and on and on. <laughs> very clever. But put, put the video in the show notes for people to see. That's hilarious. Yeah, I get calls all the time about the warranty on my engine on my car uh -huh. that I don't have, you know, so if it doesn't have a name attached to it, and I don't recognize the name, I don't answer the call. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a really fascinating use of technology. And in con this week, uh, the, the uh, this campaign won uh, the work for charity. Um, uh, it's a using deep fake technology to resurrect reporters who were killed during investigations during their investigations in Mexico. Uh, so from an ad age article, 
um, by I. Hussein Sherwood, and it was the Grand Prix for good, and it went to Still Speaking Up at Con Lions on the final day of the International Festival of Creativity, which this year I think was virtual. And they're recognizing a, a somber and really distressing campaign that highlighted the deadly profession that journalism has become for journalists in Mexico. And it's a, a very tech heavy initiative. Um, this is a legal defense organization called Propuesta Civica, and uh, the campaign is done by Publicis Worldwide Mexico. And then what they did was they adapted deep fake technology to bring four dead journalists back to life digitally to speak out against the violence that claimed their lives. And so, for example, one of them says, you know, I'm not going to hold back anything. You can't kill me twice. And um, between 2007 and 2019, when the campaign launched, more than 100 journalists were murdered in Mexico. And Proquesta, Proquesta Civica worked with the families of four of them. I'm going to butcher the names. Uh, Miroslava Breach, Javier Valdez, Moises Sanchez, and Jose Armando Rodriguez. And during the week of World Press Freedom Day, um, the resurrected digital avatars began posting on Twitter, publishing the investigations that led to their deaths and even sometimes calling out the officials who ordered the hit. And uh, renewed attention actually led to six corruption convictions. And on June 15th, one of the murdered journalists, Mira Salva Breach, tweeted conviction for Hugo Ahmed Schultz, former mayor of the municipality of Chinapa, Chihuahua for his participation in the murder of the journalist Mira Silva Breach. And um, you look at the video, I have one of them, uh, the one that I could find that was in English, uh, I'll put in the show notes, but you know, there's no way you can't tell, you can tell that that's not a live person talking. They did an astounding job. Wow. Wow. That's pretty powerful. You know, but to bring it onto Twitter, I, I, yeah. I think that's fascinating. And there was a little um, next to the person, there was sort of an ellipsis in a, in a, in a like a little blue ellipsis. Um, I, I've never seen that before. I guess that was indicating that it was part of this campaign or that it was. A what, in the video? Uh, no, on the tweets. Yeah. Next to the tweet, there's like a little, uh, like, you know, when you have a, a, a box over somebody who's speaking, what is that called? The balloon? Thought bubble? And there's a, yeah, there's like a little. It's not quite that. It's more like a little um, thing. Huh. <laughs> anyway, you'll see it in the in the tweet. But it it has three. It has an ellipsis in it, and it and it, it apparently indicates in some way that the person is not real. Okay, yeah, interesting. Mm. Uh, this is uh, our favorite topic, Lego. Our favorite company, <laughs> Lego. <laughs> uh, this is from CNN's uh, Leanne Kalirin, um, who. Uh, reports that Lego has created a throwback set. It is a 2079 piece model of a working manual typewriter. Look it out, really? Complete with moving keys and a carriage return. I don't know if it goes bing when you hit the carriage <laughs> return, but that would be awesome. Uh, the set was inspired by an idea from a British Lego <laughs> fan, Steve, Steve Guinness, of course it's Guinness. Um, he submitted his concept to the League Lego's idea platform, which takes new designs uh, from fans and puts them to a public vote and then turns them into a reality. Uh, so his winning concept won more than 10,000 votes. Uh, he will also re receive a share of the profits from the sales. Uh, the typewriter goes on sale. Um, for members in the brand's VIP site uh, this week, it went on sale and will be uh, released to general public in July. It will retail at $199.99. But it actually works? It works. You can, you can put paper, paper in yes. it? Yes, yep. Oh my God. You know, typewriters were so much better for our ergonomics because of the way that our hands were positioned for the typing. And, and I loved that ding every time you did it. That was so funny. <laughs> does that bring us to worse news? Uh, it does. What do you got? Uh, 
there's another one of our favorite companies um, that's now been bought. Uh, Hyundai's got a weird robotics video. Hyundai completed its acquisition of our favorite company, Boston Dynamics, and they have an 80% stake now in the robotics firm. And it released this truly weird video to celebrate their acquisition. Um, the source of this is Inside AI Newsletter and also Jalopnik. And the reporters are Beth Duckett and Jason Torchinsky. Um, Hyundai said its interest in Boston Dynamics lies in its multiple technologies, particularly perception, navigation, and intelligence, which totally makes sense given that cars practically, you know, do the driving without you now. So it noted that the company's uh, large growth potential and locations in Boston and uh, Silicon Valley uh, would let it tap into top robotics talent and collaborate with partners. So they developed, uh, Boston developed the four-legged spot robo dog, which went on sale commercially at the starting price of $74,500 a year ago. We talked about that on the show. It also developed robots named Cheetah, Little Dog, Big Dog, Atlas, Handle, Stretch, and some of them are featured in a viral dancing video that somehow escaped my purview, but it is freaking hilarious. And um, uh, Hyundai released this somewhat controversial promo video advertising their acquisition, and it shows a South Korean archer with robotic prosthetic legs, and it shows Spot behaving as a seeing eye dog, for, but there's other weird things in it. And, and the seeing eye dog thing, the blind person is, has got a stick and the dog is walking beside it. It's obviously not doing anything for the blind person. It, 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 the video is just weird. So um, Jason Torchinsky at Jalopnik, he riffs on the video. He says, what the hell was that? I mean, there's some cool things in there like the archer with the robotic prosthetic legs. That's very cool, but I'm not sure where they get, what they're getting at for the rest of it. Right from the beginning, you could tell someone was trying too hard. There's all bare feet and going back to the move ahead and lots of meaningless platitudes. And the end line literally is for all of us because of you. And he's, he writes, what the hell does that mean? What did any of this mean? Was this just a flex because they had some AI write the script and direct it? Did the robots write this? Are they really in charge now? Was I wrong to dismiss the silly idea of robots taking over? Hyundai, are you okay? Hyundai. <laughs> I, I, the funniest part was BL hating on, on uh, robotic dogs. You're calling robotic dogs lazy, BL. <laughs> I didn't call them lazy. Wait till you see them dance. I'm putting the video in there. <laughs> All right. Um, my favorite company to hate on, Apple, is in the news. Um, <laughs> this is uh, three articles actually on the same topic. Bloomberg's Alex Webb reports that Apple has unveiled tools that allow users of its mail app to uh, get greater control over what data to share. Um, they are, you know, this is obviously in line with Apple's uh, we protect your privacy uh, PR push. Um, so uh, it, it's in line, it, but what it, the effect it will have for email marketers, for anybody who says uses email to communicate their audiences, it will end open rates. So um, the feature is called mail privacy protection. It will automatically download data hosted remotely. So, um, you know, you have your, your images that you put in your MailChimp uh, emails and they're hosted by MailChimp. So it's gonna automatically download all that content, including your pet tracking pixels, um, whether or not somebody, the recipient opens the email. And then they're gonna strip out the IP address so you're not gonna know what location people are in. So fine, 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 fine. Um, but you know, the email open rates are, are important for understanding how well you are doing at communicating with, with your audience. A litmus software, which uh, produces uh, uh, email analytics uh, uh, service, estimates about half of all emails are opened on Apple, uh, on Apple apps. Um, the use of the tools, obviously, is going to hurt advertisers and newsletter publishers who use the, use the, that data. Uh, it does plug a gap in Apple's battle with advertiser with advertising behemoths, uh, Google, Facebook, and, and Amazon. So they stripped out the social. They're stripping out uh, the analytics from 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 websites. Now they're stripping out the 
ability to measure email. I suspect it's all going to come down to, well, you can get all that data from Apple once uh, they've got it all, all the market cornered. Um, Verges, Casey Newton points out that the value of Apple goes far beyond customer satisfaction uh, because their revenues from ads and in-app purchases grow. They're going to, you know, that, that data is going to be more valuable to them than uh, than we are giving credit. And then Litmus's Megan Lee um, has uh, some some notes that that so th what they do is they route the emails through a proxy server to preload the message content before ser serving it to readers. Uh, so even if the readers don't actually open those emails, um, the effect on any email opened from Apple's mail app on any device. Uh, no matter which email service is used. So with Apple's mail app, I can add my Gmail account, my Outlook account to Apple's email app. And uh, if I do that, then none of the metrics, none of the opens are gonna show up because it's going through Apple's app. Uh, this should not affect, however, other email apps used on Apple devices like my Gmail app. So if I just get my Gmail through my Gmail app on an iPhone, um, it's not going to affect that. The audience is, uh, so if your audience is skewed for Apple Mail users, your open rates are going to be overinflated. Uh, Apple Mail opens will probably be close to 100%, which is not realistic. I mean, app, the open rate has always been kind of, you know, a, a kind of a vanity metric. Um, I always prefer click-throughs, but um, but it also is an important thing to know because there are re-engagement campaigns that are triggered by open rates. There's automated drip campaigns that are triggered by opens. Send time optimization is triggered by opens. Real-time personalization, monitoring deliverability, all those things are, are, uh, are triggered by open rates. So um, basically Apple is stomping that down. I think you're right. They're gonna come up with their own set of metrics that uh, that they'll pull from all these sources. So does that bring us to smiles? It does. Well, I mean, this, um, <laughs> this is um, a, a tweet that I thought was really very funny, actually. Um, someone who goes by vaxxed AF still masked up uh, says, um, Melania is trending on Twitter. I don't really care, do you? And the image, of course, is the jacket that she wore when she visited children in cages at the Mexican border. Um, I thought that was amusing. <laughs> and I have another one. Do you have others? I don't. OK, so I got the best headline of the year. This is, I mean, nobody's going to write a better headline this year. The headline is, when an eel climbs a ramp to eat squid from a clamp, that's Amore. Um, it's an intensely researched article about eels, moray eels in particular, by Sabrina Imbler at the New York Times. And uh, the, the story is moray eels can hunt on land and footage from a recent study highlights that they accomplished this with a sneaky second set of jaws. And the article, you know, the Times is doing more and more extraordinary visual representations in their articles. And there are several videos of the eel, you know, eating things. And the uh, captions are, are like, are rhyming. They're very funny. I mean, but that headline, is that the best? It's fantastic. I first saw that from uh, uh, Julio Ojeda Zapata, a local tech uh, journalist who, who had posted on Twitter. It's a, it's a brilliant headline, brilliant. <laughs> really, uh, nobody's going to write a better one, I don't right. think. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's go to shiny new stuff. I've got a fantastic a resource. This is uh, the ultimate learning SEO resource. It's learningseo.io. It offers free guides and tools for learning uh, search engine optimization, and it is it is uh, comprehensive. So you can learn the basic uh, SEO basics, introduction to SEO, keyword research, competitive competition analysis. You can uh, learn about SEO processes like developing and audit or a strategy. Uh, you can learn to, et, learn to implement SEO in your CMS. So there's guides for WordPress, there's guides for Wix, there's guides for Shopify. Uh, deepen your SEO knowledge by 
uh, technical SEO, content SEO, backlinks, management, uh, SEO management, SEO opportunities, scenarios, specialized within SEO, international SEO, news SEO, local SEO, automated SEO tax, learn about SEO in other non-Google search engines, keep up with SEO news, implement free SEO tools, complement your SEO knowledge with HTML, CSS, JavaScript, soft skills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just comprehensive. We'll link to this in the show notes for everybody to find it, but it's my, it's one of the best uh, resource guides I've seen in a while. Wow, that sounds great. Good timing for me too. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, this is via Jeremy Kaplan. It's called Dphonics Ocean Noise Generator, and it lets you listen to the peaceful ocean. Uh, the calming sea or just the sounds of a rowboat or or just the beach and it has other sounds forest fireplace evening crickets and you can combine soundscapes together to help you focus or relax or you know just have fun isn't that great you're muted pro tips yep go ahead Wait. I um, have one. This is a uh, just basically be sure that your your email message doesn't contradict itself. I got an email from LinkedIn where the um, the from column in your inbox uh, said editors no reply, and then the subject line read David weigh in on the week's top stories. <laughs> which do you want me to do not reply or weigh in that's very funny that's really funny so um this is about this is from malware bites and um it's instructions on how to clear out how to clear out cookies in windows and ios on on uh desktop and mobile browsers hold on lucy knock it off Okay, <laughs> so it shows you how to do it on Chrome, Firefox, Edge, Opera, and Safari on both mobile and desktop, and that's helpful. Um, and then the other one, uh, I came across this the other day um, by accident, really. I was looking around at, at uh, Twitter lists, and um, this is a way to um, find out what lists you've been added to and and see if you want to be removed from them. So I was, for example, on a list of um, people who are uh, election result deniers uh, that included a lot of really stellar company like Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden. And, I mean, thousands of people. So I don't want to be on that list because who knows where that list is going. So this is from a Twitter post about lists and uh, they give directions for how to take yourself off the list. and. Um, the only way you can do it, which is kind of convoluted, is you have to remove, you have to block the person who started the list, then they can't see anything you say or do. But there's also lots more information about lists, including how to find them, how to create them, how to, you know, how to see the list you're on, how to add and remove people from lists. Um, so uh, that's a post worth reading from Twitter. And the one about how to remove yourself from lists, how to even find the list you are on is when you go to your list, there's a little um, three dot thing in the upper right hand corner. When you click on that, it's got some options like see what list you're on and so on. And um, so it's helpful. Very good. I didn't know that. I didn't either. I just found it by accident. Very good. So um, let's wrap this up. Weekly numbers. Um, the uh, directly communicating with friends and family is still the number one way most consumers choose to respond to a positive or negative experiences with a brand. This is from a consumer psychology survey um, published by Iterable with uh, 1,500 uh, respondents from the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, based on a media post article by Joe Mandiz. Um, so that's not surprising, word of mouth, uh, friends and family are gonna respond. Uh, but the percentage responding to positive or negative brand experiences uh, prompted them to, so by uh, positive experiences, 57% said they would buy from the brand. Uh, negative experiences, 47% said they wouldn't. 58% um, would respond to a positive experience by writing an online review compared to 28% who said they would write an online review based on a negative experience. 25% um, um, 
customer service was 25% for positive and 47% for negative. And then social media posts, which is the one we typically think of people going directly to, although that could be an online review as well. So that's a data is a little bit squishy there. Um, but 29% said they'd respond to a positive experience by, by posting online social media posts. And 21% said they'd respond to a negative experience by posting on social media. So there we go. We'll put a link to this in the show notes. I always put my positive and negative results on Twitter and the smart companies respond to you very quickly too. Uh, and they all do the same thing. Let's take this to DM. I'm like, no, I wanna do this publicly. <laughs> I can only annoy you if it's public. So um, that brings us to the end of episode 354 of the Beyond Social Media Show. And you find us by just searching for Beyond Social Media Show. Uh, links to everything we talked about and the videos that we discussed will all be on our blog, beyondsocialmediashow.com slash 354. And while you're there, subscribe to our newsletter so that we send you information about the episode and then some bonus information every week and some interesting stuff to, to read and so on. And uh, we would love to know what you think by leaving us a review at Beyond Social Media Show dot com slash love. Um, I am here with uh, the always charming David Erickson. On Twitter, he's D Erickson. On Instagram, he's D E Erickson. On YouTube, he's E Strategy. And he blogs at E hyphen strategy blog.com. I'm BL Ackman. I'm what's next on Twitter. My blog is what's next blog. Um, I'm what's next blog on YouTube. I have a website at blockman.com. The show again, beyond social media show.com. And on Twitter, where we hope you'll follow us at BS Media Show. You can listen to or subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts. And we're on Audible now. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. And you can tell your smart speaker to play Beyond Social Media Show. So we will be back next week with my interview of Bob Hoffman. Thanks for watching. <laughs>